in the, the book of Revelation, uh, which Laura mentioned, or uh, which um, uh, Nicole mentioned is uh, the last book of the Bible. Um, I'm, I'm sure you all knew that anyway. Um, so if you're looking for the book of Revelation, I hope you brought your Bibles this morning because we're going to be reading from it. And uh, if you're looking for Revelation, <laughs> Chris, <laughs> If you're, yeah, what, what page is that on as I flip through my device? Uh, if, you, if you have your Bible, the book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible, uh, so, and we're in chapter one. So um, there, we're, we're going to read through the passage, uh, chapter one, verses nine to 20, and in this passage, uh, we see uh, Jesus. Uh, so, uh, so let's, before we go any further, let's, let's read what we, ha- what we see there. Um, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patience, patient endurance that our, our, that our hours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos, uh, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of hell and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And we pray that God will bless the reading of his word to our hearts and to our lives and give us understanding uh, as to what he wants us to know. Now, um, First, first, let's let's get the obvious out of the way, okay? Uh, the book of Revelation was written by John, the apostle. Uh, he's also called the beloved disciple or the disciple that Jesus loved. He was one of the sons of Zebedee. His brother James was the other son of Zebedee, which Jesus gave the name uh, Boanerges, which means the sons of thunder. Uh, and he also wrote the Gospel of John and the three epistles, the first, second, third John, uh, and the book of Revelation here. So he's, he has written uh, some of the New Testament, which we know. Um, it was, it's unknown when it was written, probably around uh, near the end of the first century, between 94 and 96 uh, AD, and he was writing from the island of Patmos, uh, to which he was exiled by uh, one of the Roman emperor, emperors, I think it was Diocletian now, um, as a punishment for preaching the gospel. He says that uh, he was there writing from the island of Patmos uh, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So he was sharing his faith, and he was punished for it. Uh, now, it's obvious that he was allowed to some freedom there because he wrote this letter uh, 
to the churches, and so he had some freedom. Uh, I don't know how much freedom he had, um, uh, but he was confined to the island, and uh, he had a vision, had this vision of Jesus. And the letter was written to seven churches in Asia Minor, and I don't have, I don't have a map of uh, Asia Minor, but uh, I, th I think in the back of your Bible somewhere there's probably, probably a map there. And the seven churches are all in, in Asia Minor. They're in a big circle, and they were centers, uh, some of which, not all of which Paul had visited to share the gospel, but some of which were there, and they, were, they had churches and they had uh, uh, something about them that Jesus wanted to address, uh, first of all, at the beginning of his, his, uh, his revelation. And um, so, so he appears to John as he's on the island of Patmos. And um, this vision that John had was a vision of the risen, uh, glorified Jesus, the person Jesus, the historical person Jesus who lived, who uh, walked among men. And there are two, two other um, instances where the scriptures um, uh, report of uh, the, the, the glorified Jesus in the scriptures, do you know where they are? One one of them is pretty obvious. It's in the in, it's in the Gospels. What? Transfiguration. The Transfiguration. That's right. That's that's one. Okay. It's recorded in in three Gospels. We'll call that one one instant. Okay. Where's Where's the other? Yes. Yes, those those are appearances of Jesus, but I'm thinking primarily the glorified Jesus. So this this is one instance. The transfiguration is another instance. Uh, those those are important, Ed. They they are definitely important, and and uh, and we're going to see about that a little later, but. Uh, where is the other instance of the risen or, or the glorified Jesus? Josh, did you want to say something? Paul, the um, I did, actually, I didn't think of that one. But yeah, that, uh, it's, it is, I suppose, yeah, um, that, that's, a good, that's a good point. I, know, I didn't think of that one. Uh, where, where Paul had seen a great uh, shining light and heard Jesus. But there is one more. Sorry. I, I, okay, there's three other ones. There's one more. There's one, one, one more. Okay, let's... The resurrection. Yes, that was an appearance of Jesus. But again, it was, uh, I'm thinking primarily of the, the glorified Jesus. Okay, let's... Uh, if, if you did bring your Bibles, uh, turn to um, Isaiah chapter 6. It was kind of a trick question. You, did, you probably didn't think of Isaiah. Uh, but remember that Isaiah saw the Lord in chapter 6. And it, it says there, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings, with two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet, and with two, they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from, with tongs from the altar. With, with it, he touched my mouth and said, See, I've touched, or 
this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom sh shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. How do we know that's Jesus? Well, if you'll turn with me to John chapter 12. Jesus was quoting from Isaiah chapter 6 in John chapter 12. And he said, verse 37, uh, even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. For this reason, they could not believe because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and darkened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them. And verse 41 says, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. And the passage he's referring to is Isaiah chapter 6. So that's the other uh, passage where Jesus is... Uh, is the, the glorified Jesus is accounted in the scriptures. Um, now, um, the book of Revelation is, is prophetic. It's written in prophetic language. It's hard to understand. Sometimes it begins with a current statement of the uh, condition of the faith and testimony of a representative group of churches, local churches, uh, physically located in Asia Minor in the province the Roman province of Asia. Uh, it continues through the history of the church and it wraps up, it ends with the return of Christ, the judgment of his enemies, and the redemption of creation. It's difficult to understand, it's, it's as difficult to understand today as it was for John in his day to understand and his contemporaries. And it's as difficult as it was for Daniel who also had a vision of... Uh, uh, Jesus, and was told about the end times. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you, if you go back, we're not going to go back to it, but if you go back to Daniel chapter 12, I think it is, it says, said that Daniel was so distraught that his face turned pale as he thought about the vision and the explanation of the vision that was given to him. It's difficult. And uh, I, as there's going to be two, two other guys who will be preaching from the book of Revelation, and uh, I get to be the first. So I get to be the one who defers to them the great pleasure of revealing to you the book of Revelation. Um, what I want to speak about this morning is something really important uh, that... Uh, I think I think needs to be understood as we as we approach the book of Revelation, and uh, and uh, it's it's the fact that Jesus is revealing Himself. Uh, last week, two weeks ago, we were we were uh, really Bonnie and I were really blessed to be on vacation, and we. We got to spend it at uh, a cottage in East Dalhousie, uh, which belongs to my s sister and brother-in-law who are here this morning. And we really appreciate th the opportunity to spend time there. We love it. We really love it. And uh, wh we try to relax while we were there. And so um, while we were there, uh, one of the things that, uh, that Bonnie likes to do is, is to... to watch movies uh, and uh, so we I was I was reading and Bonnie was watching Anne of Green Gables and uh, I was trying to quietly read while she was trying to watch and uh, and all of a sudden I my ears perked up because I heard uh, who who hasn't seen Anne of Green Gables with uh, Megan Follows and 
and Colleen Dewhurst. Okay, <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, I'll, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give anything away here. Uh, Megan Follows said this line. She said, "There is a book of revelations in everyone's life." What do people mean when they say that? What do people mean when they say, there's a book of revelations in everybody's life? They, they mean that there's, there's an end to everybody's life, right? And it's, that's really, you know, when, when I heard that, I, I, I wrote it down because I knew that, uh, you know, I would be able to use that. And so... It's really unfortunate that when people think of the book of Revelation, they think of the end. Because it's not the end. It's really not. Uh, the book of Revelation is, it, it actually gets its name from uh, chapter 1, verse 1, where it said, says, uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's what it is. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so... Uh, it's really unfortunate <clears throat> that when people think of Revelation, they think of the end. Uh, because it's really, the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And I believe that uh, if we're going to understand what God wants to do in our lives, we have to understand this. That God wants to be known. And he wants you and me to know him. And so as, as I was preparing for this message, I, I, I put a little Facebook poll out there to all my Facebook friends. And I asked three questions. Uh, and uh, you, might, you might, I don't know how many of you are my friends on Facebook. Uh, but uh, but I, got, <laughs> I got four responses. <laughs> uh, I asked these three questions. Is God personal. Two, can we perceive God apart from his revelation to us? And three, how do we find the kind of relationship that God wants to have with us? And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, those three questions. So number, first one, is God personal? I don't know if you've noticed, uh, but it's really, it, it really hits me in the face all, of, all the time, continuously. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a trend toward the impersonal today. You know, uh, since, you know, you can go back uh, to, I'm not going to bore you with philosophers' names and stuff like that, but, you know, a couple hundred years ago, and, and see that people objectify everything. Especially in our culture, we objectify everything, even people, even each other. And, you know, the reason why we do that is because we want what we want so bad that we will do anything to have our own way. And it doesn't matter who we have to climb over, who we have to push aside. Uh, you know, and right now you're probably thinking of your last encounter at Walmart or in the grocery store or something like that. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter who's in the way. We want what we want. And it doesn't matter who we have to push aside. And I say we, be, and, and I should slap myself, uh, because I know that none of you are like that. Uh, you know, it's the people out there that are, that are like that. They, they, they see people as people in their way. And so... They objectify them, and in order for me to, to get my way, you have to lose your, your personhood. And this really affect, affects everything in our culture. And it extends not just to people, but to God as well. And specifically, God's holiness and righteousness and justice and his, uh, what he calls on me to do as, as a, a person created in his image. So, uh, so, so in order for me to 
live in this me-centered uh, culture and universe that I've created for myself, I have to objectify God. And in effect, what happens to God is that he becomes an icon. And you all know what an icon is. It's those things on your computer screen that tell you what's, what's behind it if you click on it, right? And so when God becomes an icon, he loses his personality. He loses his, um, his power and relevance. And there's no expectations anymore. To give you an example of this, uh, you all probably are familiar with uh, Star Wars and uh, the Force. The Force is, uh, you know, something that moves in and through all of us and binds all things together. Okay, that's that's a philosophy. That's that's Eastern philosophy. If you didn't if you didn't recognize that, I want to throw a couple of things up on the screen that maybe you've seen. Uh, this one. Uh, when you really want something, it's because the desire originated in the soul of the universe. It's your mission. In the soul of the universe. And uh, uh, the next one is, is pretty much like it. Uh, you are the universe experiencing itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's, let's put the third one up there too, Dave. Uh, this, is, this is the Tao, if anybody didn't know. Uh, here's the bad, here's the good, here's the bad uh, that is in the good, and here's the good that's in the bad, and here's life. Like this. I, I, know, that, I, I know that when we see that, we, we, you know, we might smile, you know, chuckle, kind of. But, the, but this, is, this is the world we live in. And uh, so... Uh, what happens to the world when, when everybody loses their personality? What happens to the world when I get everything that I want? And, and when you get everything you want? Or when you're entitled to everything you want, and I'm entitled to everything I want? What happens? It's total anarchy. I mean, if I get what I want and you get what you want and they're clashing with each other, then it's whatever, everybody for himself. But that's not the God that we see in the scriptures. Uh, what, what do we see from the scriptures? Well, in Genesis chapter 3, after the creation of man, we see God walking in the garden, which speaks of communion and personal relationship. Genesis 18, God visits Abraham before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It speaks of promise. That's when he's made the promise uh, to Abraham that he would have a child. Uh, Genesis 32, God wrestles with Jacob and gives him a blessing. God's presence means blessing. God, uh, jo uh, Joshua chapter 5, God appears to Joshua before the conquest of Jericho speaks of assurance. So the presence of God that speaks of all these things, and that's just in the Old Testament. Um, uh, other instances where God communicates in the Old Testament is to Cain, calls him to accountability, to Noah, culpability, guilt, grace, deliverance, and protection, to Moses, his appearance to Moses, redemp speaks of redemption. And to all of the prophets, major or minor, it speaks of God's faithfulness to his promises. If you read those, that's what, that's what you get the sense, that the presence of God means all these things. And that's just the Old Testament. When we come to the New Testament, we have Jesus. John chapter 1, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled. He stayed. He walked among us. In um, Isaiah 9, uh, or Isaiah 7, you should call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was sent. And so what we read in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. 
the Holy Spirit is God continuing to be with us. Uh, and when we come to Revelation, Jesus is among the candlesticks. His presence. He is present. God is not just um, an object, an icon out there. That, you know, something uh, that when we talk about God, there's nothing behind the word that we mean. But when we speak of God, we, we really mean the one who is real, who is there, who, who, it, who gives us assurance, who calls us to repentance, who gives us, a, uh, uh, who redeems us, promise, blessing, all of those things. When, when we see uh, those, um, those signs that, you know, speak of the, the universe and, and, and the, the impersonality of things uh, that really don't give meaning to our lives, when we see that, uh, we are diminished because we are created in the image of God to have a relationship with him. There is a God who can be known. There is a God who is really there and he wants to be known and he wants you and me to know him. But can we perceive God apart from how he reveals himself to us? Uh, in if you'll turn with me to Romans chapter uh, 11. Paul is, is teaching or writing uh, about the Jews here. And, and in, in, Verse 33, chapter 11, verse 33. There, you know, I, I don't know if you've noticed this in, a, in other places in Paul's writing, but there are times when, when Paul just gets so overwhelmed by what he's, what he's thinking about and what, how God's working in his life and in, on, on his heart and what he's talking about, that he just has to stop and praise the Lord. And that's, this is one of those instances where Paul just stops and, and you know, if you have headings in your... In your Bibles, it might be called a doxology, where Paul praises God and he says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that he should repay him? For from him and through him and, and to him are all things to him be glory forever. Amen. Amen. Uh, his ways are unsearchable. They're past finding out. Uh, Job uh, 5, 9 says he performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. And Job was one of the wise guys, sorry, he was one of the wisest uh, men in the East of his time. Uh, and uh, if you read the book of Job, and I encourage you to, to do that, you find that uh, Job maintains his innocence. He lost everything in one day. His family, uh, all, all except for his wife, uh, he, and he lost his, his health and uh, had to sit down in, in ashes and, and scrape himself. And, and he was visited by his friends. And, he, and the whole discussion uh, throughout the book of Job, Job... Um, asks for an audience with God. And when God finally shows up, he searches Job. He, he cross-examines him with, with these questions like, uh, you know, where were you when the, when the foundations of the earth were, were, were laid? Uh, there are questions meant to, to show Job just, uh, you know, how little uh, he really knew. Uh, and we should be careful about the vast extent of the wealth and knowledge and wisdom that we've accumulated. We should be careful. We should consider carefully what we really know. Uh, we're, not, we're not all that educated compared to the knowledge, the riches of grace and knowledge 
and wisdom that the Lord has. Uh, we should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought. And so when it comes to perceiving God, who really makes the first move? You know, when, when we were kids, we were out playing games outside. How, how do we decide who goes first? Right? We, we put our fists in and we go, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Or uh, the one that I really like is, my mother punched your mother right in the nose. Remember that one? Of course, today it would be like, my mother scratched your mother's eyes out or something like that. <laughs> I don't know. But how, how do we really decide who goes first? Who makes the first move? Well, it's totally random, right? We, we pick, although, you know, I had, a, I had a brother who's pretty close to my age. He found a way to cheat at everything. Uh, and it was really incredible, and I was, I was a bit naive. I never got on <laughs> until I was later, and I thought, yeah, you know, he pulled some fast ones. Uh, but, um, but God doesn't leave it, things up to chance when it comes to something so important as revealing himself to us. And so he makes the first move. Uh, he's calling to us. Uh, first Kings... Chapter 19, we find uh, Elijah uh, running from uh, the king and hiding out. And God comes to him. First Kings chapter 19, right? <clears throat> uh, verse uh, 9. Uh, God calls to Elijah. And he said, the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have, have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. And I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, get out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, and the Lord is about to pass, pass by, and then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper, and Elijah heard it. He pulled his cloak over his head, over his face, and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. God showed his greatness, his, his power. That wind shook the mountain, tore it apart, and the earthquake came, and the fire. But God wasn't in any of those. There are times when God is in those things. But God speaks through a gentle whisper. God reveals himself to us in, in two ways, through, through general revelation, which is uh, the created universe. Um, Psalm 19, 1 to 4, says, the heavens declare the glory of God day after day. They pour forth speech, and there is no language where, where their voice is not heard. There's nowhere on earth where the heavens do not declare the work of God and the glory of God. And so God, in his creation, is shouting, Here I am! Look, here I am! And he wants to be revealed. He wants to be known. And so God speaks through general revelation. He also reveals himself to... In special revelation, the word of God, the written word, John said about uh, the, gospel, the gospel that he had written, these are written so that you may know or that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life through his name. And God also reveals himself through the living word of God, the Son of God. Hebrews 1.3 says the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact, the exact 
representation of his being. And so uh, we, we have uh, these organizations. Uh, one of them we call SETI. Do you know what SETI is? Some of you are whispering. What, what is it? Yeah, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It's hard to say. Uh, and they look out there, and they, you know, they, they project a message out there. And the message that they project out there uh, may be uh, summed up best in, in the uh, Carpenter song. Finish, finish this quote. Calling occupants. Of interplanetary craft, that's right. And so that's, that's what they, they're looking out there to find occupants of interplanetary craft. And, uh, you know, you talk about missing the forest for the trees. Here they are, they're looking out there. And what do they see? <laughs> they see nothing. They see nothing. But the heavens are declaring, here I am! I really feel sorry, I honestly feel sorry for the agnostics. You know, if you don't know, an agnostic is someone who uh, can't, who, can, who says there's, there's no definitive proof for the existence of God, therefore they choose not to believe. Okay, well, the agnostics have exactly the same information that I have and that you have. There's the beauty of creation. How, how can you not, I, I mean, I, granted, granted, God has left room for us not to believe. I mean, it's obvious because there are unbelievers. But the evidence is so overwhelming in his favor that to choose not to believe, you know, and I and I realize that in 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 our group this morning, there may be someone who's searching, maybe some, someone who's who's not convinced yet, maybe who thinks that you you know maybe maybe they're here with someone who's a believer, but they're not, maybe someone who um, who's who, who can't put the pieces together. Uh, and that may be even wrong to say that. Someone who, someone who may not have all the pieces of the puzzle, like the rest of us. I encourage you to look at the wealth of evidence that there is. That the universe is the handiwork of God. And certainly, certainly, there is something in our very hearts. The scriptures say that he has placed eternity in our hearts. And there is something there, a longing for a home. Yes, there is, there is a God who is there. The heavens declare it, and he is pursuing us, and he has shown himself. He has initiated the, com the conversation. He has placed within us a homing device, if you will, which causes us to want what only he has for us, a home for our hearts, a home where we are loved, and a home where we truly belong. And we sense it. We sense it deeply. Maybe it's through our, our disappointments, our disillusionments. Uh, but certainly, certainly we know that there's more. And uh, so, so he is calling to us. And thirdly, how do, we, how do we find the relationship that God wants to have with us? <clears throat> I believe the answer is found in Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 
12. We'll begin at verse 28, where one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. And he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. There's no commandment greater than these. So that kind of speaks to our objectification of God and our fellow travelers, doesn't it? You know, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, <laughs> and, and Jesus calls it a commandment. Not just any commandment, but the greatest. And, and it is a commandment. That God wants us to love him. We're commanded to love God with all of our heart. But it's not just a commandment. It's so wrapped up with who, in, in who we are. And as image bearers, God created us for relationship. God, what, what it means to be created in the image of God is to, is to crave to be loved and to have the propensity to love. He has been drawing us into that kind of relationship. Uh, if, you, if you turn to Acts chapter 10, you see an amazing account of a transformation. Uh, how God calls us into a relationship with him. In this chapter we find... Uh, Peter, who's, been, who's really been set up rather nicely by his spirit. Uh, up to this point, you know, the, the Jews were the only ones who, uh, well, that were, we know of, uh, who have received the gospel and has, have uh, had the gospel preached to them, has received the Holy Spirit. Uh, up to this point, and, you know, uh, Peter really needs a lesson in, in, um, in just who God wants to come alongside. And up to this point, Peter's, you know, um, uh, you know, he's pretty, pretty narrow in, it, in who he thinks, who he thinks is uh, the gospel's designed for. His, his views are pretty national. And so in the previous chapters, God's been setting him up for this visit to Cornelius. And finally, he gets there after, after you know, being invited by Cornelius. And who is Cornelius? Cornelius is, is a Roman centurion. You know, he's part of the occupying force in Israel. And... Uh, we we don't have time to go into all of the details about what that means, but uh, Roman soldiers weren't really known for their piety uh, or their or their generosity. But Cornelius is different. He's a centurion and and in the Roman army, and uh, and he he's a God fearer, you know. So. So we really see in, in this passage uh, an account of who God wants to reach out to, who God wants to reveal himself to. And there's a couple of things you need to take note about Cornelius uh, as we approach this passage. And, and the greatest one is that Cornelius was a worshiper of the true God. And uh, he was not only a worshiper, but he, he prayed uh, regularly, uh, and he was part of God's justice team in the area. 
Uh, he was, uh, he gave to the poor. He was part of the relief mission. Uh, but there was something missing in Cornelius' life. And, and as we come to this passage, we see that uh, verse 34, uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 34 says, then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the, with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. So Peter reminds Cornelius of all the things that he already knows. He's seen all this. He's heard about it. He's witnessed it. And he says to him, verse 39, we are witnesses of everything that he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him from the dead and, uh, on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised uh, believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speak in tongues and praising God. So the thing that was lacking in Cornelius' life was even though he was a God-fearing man, though he prayed and, and, and gave, he did the things that, that, he, that God would be pleased with. The thing that was lacking was a knowledge of who Jesus is, an understanding of how to approach God. And so when Peter comes, he preaches Jesus crucified and risen and alive and Jesus as Lord. And it was not until then that the Holy Spirit was poured out on Cornelius and his household. And so we see that there's, there's one, one good explanation for this, that God wants to be known. And in order for this to take place, he must reveal himself to us. And he always reveals himself through the person and work of Jesus Christ and none other. Cornelius needed needed to hear about the death of Jesus. He needed to hear that his sins could be forgiven through the risen Lord. And when he heard Peter speak, there was something that took place in his mind and in his heart that caused him to pass from death to life. I believe it was a decision about the truthfulness of what Peter was saying. One more passage I want to look at, and it's in Acts chapter 16, where Paul and Silas are in prison. And uh, they were put in prison because of something that had happened in Philippi while they were, while they were there. And uh, as they were uh, thrown into prison, uh, uh, verse... 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and at once the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell, trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they re replied, Believe 
in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all, to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and immediately he, he and his family were baptized. What must I do to be saved? The Philippian jailer asked. And the answer to that question, I think, is the answer to uh, a few different questions. Do you believe that God exists? Uh, the Philippian jailer had been aware of all that Paul and Silas had been doing. He was aware of why they were in prison. He heard their prayers, their songs, and he heard them uh, telling their fellow prisoners about Christ. Do you believe that God exists and that he personally is calling you into relationship with him through Jesus Christ? Do you believe that you are guilty morally and need the forgiveness, the forgiveness that Jesus provided for on the cross? And do you believe that Jesus died in your place, bearing your sin? And do you cast yourself on Jesus, trusting him alone for salvation? If the answer to those questions is yes, then by the promise of the, the scriptures, you will be saved. God is calling us to come home. It's that still small voice in our hearts that we hear from time to time, maybe not all the time, but he is speaking and he speaks to us in a still small voice and he calls to us. He calls us to come home like children who have stayed out too late. Remember, you know, being outside in the evening when it's time to come in, your mother, your father would swing open the door no matter where you were in the neighborhood. You could hear them calling. It's time to come home. It's time to come in. So... God is calling us through Jesus Christ. He says it's time to come home. It's time to be loved. It's time to love me. He wants to be known, and he wants you and me to know him. He makes himself known to us in a very real and meaningful way through Jesus Christ. And I just want to read to you the words of a song, I think, Kind of, uh, kind of says it really well. Um, uh, you may not be familiar with uh, Don Francisco. Uh, some of you may. Hopefully some of you have heard of him. He's a really uh, blessed songwriter. His ministry has been blessed by the Lord, and the song is called, I Don't Care Where You've Been Sleeping. Some of you may know it. <laughs> Maybe going through your mind right now. Um, wish it hadn't been so long since I played the guitar. I might be <laughs> tempted to play it for you, but I'll, for now, I'll just read it. I loved you long before the time your eyes first saw the day, and everything I've done has been to help you on your way. But you took all that you wanted, and at last you took your leave and traded off a kingdom for the lies that you've believed. And although you've chosen darkness with its miseries and fears, although you've go gone so far from me and wasted all these years, even though my name's been spattered by the mire in which you lie, I take you back. I take you back. This instant, if you turn to me and cry, when you come back to your senses and you see who's been to blame, remember all the good things that were yours with just my name. Then don't waste another thought before you change the way you're bound. I'll be running out to meet you if you only turn around. I don't care where you've been sleeping. I don't care who's made your bed.
I've already gave my life to set you free. And there's no sin you could imagine that is stronger than my love. And it's all yours if you'll come home again to me. God is calling us to come home. I, I want to be there. I hope you do too. I hope you'll listen to his voice. I hope that he's been speaking to you this morning. And if, if you uh, need to talk to someone about your relationship with Christ, you can talk to me. You can talk to any number of people who are here this morning. But I want to make myself available. If you, if you need to talk to someone, uh, I'll, I'll be here. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for <clears throat> revealing yourself through your son, Jesus Christ, whom uh, you have shown us so well, through whom you've so, shown us so well that you, you are so great and awesome uh, and and the love that you have for us is so great. And the invitation that we have received from you to come and be loved and to love you is, it speaks to our hearts of, of the home that we, where we belong. And Lord, though uh, we've, we've ran in the other direction, we've ran away from you, you, your arms are still wide open and you calling, you're calling to us through Christ to come, to come home. Lord, we want, we want to be there. We pray that you'll continue to reveal yourself to us and, and work in our hearts and lives uh, to show us, continue to show us Christ. And Lord, if there's even one person here who needs uh, yet to experience your forgiveness so that they may love you. I pray that you'd reach into that person's heart and life and, and make uh, your voice uh, heard and beyond question that you have a place and a home for each of us. Thank you so much for your grace and your love, in Jesus' name.